Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our pop-up event on Detangling Nuclear Command and Control. I'm Andrew Fassini, the Communications Director for the Institute for Security and Technology, and I am thrilled to be facilitating this timely conversation. Now would normally be the time where we tell you where the fire exits are and to turn off your cell phones, but since we're all tuning in remotely today, I'll just give a quick thank you to all of us here live on Zoom, watching our simul stream over on Twitch, and for those of you watching this in the future on a recording somewhere on our website. During this event, please do feel free to submit questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll reserve some time near the end to answer them. Now, it is absolutely my privilege to turn things over to our moderator, Lauren DeYoung Shulman. Good afternoon, everyone. I am really excited to be here with you. Uh, I'm Lauren DeYoung Shulman. I, amongst many hats, uh, am an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. I worked for about 10 years in government at the Department of Defense at the White House and um, had a lot of curiosity around many of the issues that we are engaging on here today. My specialty in terms of scholarship is civil military relations, which comes at the heart of many of the questions that we are gonna engage on, but is also significantly more complicated by the addition of, you guessed it, nuclear weapons. Uh, when I worked at the White House it, about, let's see, this was been in 2011, around 10 years ago, I was at an event and was standing next to a couple of folks who didn't work in national security, worked in government, but didn't work in national security. And they, we were standing at the front of the event, um, kind of off to the side. And there was this guy in the back corner kind of standing off. Um, they just started hanging out, talking to people before the event got started. He was in a military uniform. He was in his early, early mid thirties and he had a briefcase and it was kind of cute. So my friend said, who's that guy? So I said, he's the guy, he's the White House guy, uh, military aide who carries nuclear football. And she said, football doesn't look like a football. Like uh, it, it's a briefcase. It's, it's how the president organizes um, a nuclear command and control system situation. Like it's, it's, the, it's for basically for the president to launch nuclear war. I'm just trying to like summarize things as we're trying to move into the event. And she's like, whoa, whoa, there's a button inside. I was like, no, the, the, the president calls his military advisors and he brings everybody else in and there's a conference and here's how you do this. And I'm, again, just trying to move along. She looks at me again and she so points to the guy who's in his early 30s and says, so wait, he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? And like, all right, I give up. OK, we are I, I'm clearly I'm the wrong person to try to explain this as we're trying to go into this event. But that kind of confusion, I find, is resident not just amongst the folks who don't work in national security, but frankly, I mean, among a less the national security community. There's a ton of assumptions around how is this process supposed to work? And let's be real, it has a lot of consequences. So all of these assumptions, all of this mystery, mystery the reading of tea leaves makes me feel deeply uncomfortable. So we brought together a really expert panel probably just to exacerbate my discomfort, but also probably to give it a little bit more information behind it, to engage on what exactly is the state of our nuclear command and control system right now, particularly given recent comments in the Bob Woodward, Bob Costa book. So I'm gonna start uh, with some questions and I'll ask as I turn to you for our panelists to introduce themselves uh, when I turn to you for a question. I'm gonna start first with Amy. Um, so just to recap a bit uh, what most folks know, I think in the last month, particularly on social media, it felt like everyone became a sudden expert overnight on nuclear command and control issues. And as they always do, CRS, Congressional Research Service, published an excellent brief on the topic to set us straight, to remind us that yes, the president does have sole authority to authorize the use of nuclear weapons and many other details associated with that. But he can't, in practice, do it alone, completely alone. So Amy, can you break down for us at a very high level, noting this is a complex topic, the nuclear command and control system. What exactly is this? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first, I'm a specialist in nuclear weapons policy at the Congressional Research Service. So I'm the owner and keeper of the little two page report that Lauren referred to. It's actually been in my portfolio for probably close to five years now, because the issue, even though we're in the latest iteration of it, has been coming up more often in the last five years, and I think in my previous entire career at CRS. So this is a very complex system designed to provide the president with the information he needs to make a decision, and then the tools he needs to authorize a launch. 
And what I'm going to do right now for the sake of simplicity is read or summarize a couple of pieces that are in the paper and then try and break it down even more simplistically into who does what to whom in this process. First, the nuclear command and control system is a whole set of technologies and human beings that collects information on threats to the United States. So it sits there all the time looking at what's going on in the world. Then when there's a threat that might require a nuclear response, communicates that information to the president. The people in this system advise the president on his different options for responses. And the president then chooses a response, communicates back to these people what his choice is. And those, that choice is then communicated to the troops in the field who then launch the weapons. So it's an information in, communication amongst people, information back out system. And I'm going to focus specifically on the communication part of the system because that's what General Milley's comments and the Costa and Woodward book referred to. But basically, if information comes in, and it could be that we're under nuclear attack or we're in a situation that might require a nuclear response, the president would participate in an emergency communications conference with the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, other military advisors. They would offer the President information and details about what's going on out there in the world and what his options are for responding. There's a lot of misperception out there that they would tell the President he has to use nuclear weapons. That is not true. That is not the only choice the President has, even if we are under attack. The president has a range of options and they would fill him in on what those options are. And then when the president makes his choice, which could be to use nuclear weapons or not, they would authenticate that order. And if they thought what he had asked for was unwise, they would have more conversation and talk to him about the implications. But once the president says, no, this is what I wanna do, that order would be communicated. So what would happen then is the president would open the football the briefcase you mentioned, look through the options book and communicate through the communication system in that briefcase to the officer of the watch or leadership in the Pentagon, who would then authenticate the order and communicate to the forces in the field. First, most important, most obvious point, that suitcase does not contain a red button. The president does, doesn't go, boom, I've launched the weapons. He doesn't launch the weapons. He communicates his choice to the people who would pass along that order to the people who would launch the weapons. Now, this all presumes there is a threat out there that is being communicated to the president. In theory, at least, the president could initiate the process himself, even if the military doesn't, as Peter Fever at Duke University says, the military doesn't wake up the president, the president could wake up the military, could say, look, I'm really concerned, I wanna do this, this is my authentic order and he could communicate to the Pentagon. Now, what we learned from General Milley's memo that he provided to the SASC last week is that even in that circumstance, there would be a conference, that the conference would convene to authenticate the order. And again, if there were concerns about the president's choice to review that with the president. However, these people in this conference do not have to agree with the president's choice and they cannot veto the president's choice. If they believe it's unwise or they believe different weapons, different targets, different problems should be addressed, they confer with him, but it is the president's decision. Now, I will leave it at that and come back to some quotes from the hearing that Senator Corker held in SFRC, Senate Foreign Relations Committee back in 2017 to address these issues. But that's the basic system and the way it works, or the way we in the public think it works. There's a lot of intricacies and details, but I will leave that to everybody else on the panel. Amy, that was, I think, as clear as it possibly could be in terms of how the system is supposed to work. But there is such tremendous amounts of mythology around it, for, both from the folks who are self-designated experts on Twitter, but also just in the long history of many issues related to this. So I'm going to start, I'll ask both Alex and Mike, if you could introduce yourselves, what are some of the most consistent misconceptions about this system that even among experts you sometimes hear, or beyond misconceptions, 
what is it we generally genuinely don't know um, or would like to know more about around the system? So Alex, I'll start with you. All right, I'll start. I'm Alex Wellerstein. I am a, a professor of history of uh, science technology at the Stevens Institute of Technology, where I work on the history of nuclear weapons primarily, and have been spending a lot of times, a lot of time over the last five years, trying to um, essentially pull together as much as we can know in the public domain on this specific topic, right? And this is a real reading of the tea leaves and every little memo and trying to chart not only the current state of the system, but also its historical evolution as much as one can do without a security clearance, which is, you know, more than most people think, but less than we'd like. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly say that the biggest conceptions I see, misconceptions that I see, um, one is that it's too easy, which we've already addressed as the big red button, which aside from not giving you any options is ridiculously dangerous and nobody wants that. Uh, my way of putting it is, is if, if your system allows a cat to start nuclear war, then we wouldn't be alive because cats would do it in a moment. So, you know, that isn't how it's set up. The, uh, the other misconception is to go too far the other way and believe that there are people in the chain of command who can veto. Um, specifically, the biggest misconception is, I think that is most common among experts is that the Secretary of Defense plays a sort of veto role in this. And the origins of that are pretty straightforward. Much of the old doctrine refers to this as the uh, National Command Authorities, the NCA, which in most cases means the President and the Secretary of Defense. And the Goldwater Nichols Act says that the chain of command in most cases goes from the president to the secretary of defense to the field commanders. Uh, but it also says that the president can set up doctrine that changes that. And my suspicion is that some of those documents that General Milley cites uh, give out something that is different than the Goldwater Nichols Act in, in certain ways. Um, in terms of what we don't know, uh, all of what Amy has said, for example, it, it comes from this sort of reading different accounts that have been released. Some of this is doctrine. Some of this is testimony by people who are aware of the, you know, who are at least presumably are aware of the chain of command, uh, previous secretaries of defense, things that have been released. Even this memo that Millie put out explaining his positions contains some details that I don't think we really had sort of fixed before he put it out. Um, so there's a lot of functional details in there, especially in the case that Amy mentioned, um, where it's not, there's a threat in the world and the president's reacting to it, but in situations where the president may be instigating the action, uh, exactly how far can that go? Exactly how flexible is the system? There are some indications that this system, which is designed to um, essentially prevent a surprise attack, um, is extremely flexible in terms of how many of these things are actually required and how many of them are not. Could you, under state of emergency, Bruce Blair used to say, the late Bruce Blair, that under the most duress, the president could actually call the <laughs> launch silos and get them to do it directly. Is that true? I don't know. Bruce Blair never gave me sources. So it was always really tricky to sort of authenticate that sort of thing. But to me, that's where a lot of uncertainty is. And my sense, and this is just my sense, and then I'll turn it over to Mike, my sense from reading some of this testimony is that even some of these people at the highest level of the military and government have uncertainty on some of these situations too, that not every situation is sort of unambiguously clear as to how these chains of command and authority could work, especially under the sort of not expected situation. It's not the nukes are incoming, but anything beyond that. And I think that that's where a lot of the uncertainty and uh, uncomfortableness comes from with the question of either the crazy president question, which is how it's been framed since, since the Nixon era, uh, but even things that are less crazy, even things that are just very ill-advised uh, and things like that. Anyway, I'll pass it on the mic. Well, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for, for inviting me to participate in this. I, I really appreciate it. I've already learned a bunch this morning myself, just uh, listening to the last few speakers. And I, I, I think I concur with virtually everything that I've heard. So real quick, my background, uh, after high school, I joined the Army and spent some time in the Army and got out and went to school. Uh, part of that included law school eventually. And I went back in the Army as a judge advocate. So I was a lawyer in the Army for about 27 years. Uh, my last couple of assignments, I worked at Special Operations Command, the U.S. Special Operations Command 
for a fellow by the name of William McRaven. I was his lawyer. And then I went to Northcom and NORAD and worked there for, for a tour. And then finally, my last job in the Army, and this is the main reason I'm here, I think, that why I was invited is at STRATCOM. Uh, I now teach at U Utah Valley University, but I was at STRATCOM on the staff. I was a staff judge advocate. So I was the senior lawyer at U.S. Strategic Command, which is the combatant command responsible for conducting, were we ever to have to, a nuclear warfare or nuclear event. Uh, STRATCOM would be the com combatant commander over that. Just like it's been discussed, the chain of command essentially goes from the president to secretary of defense to STRATCOM and then to the units in the field. And so I was the senior lawyer there and was exposed to these concepts. Now you might be thinking right off like a lawyer, you're kidding me, right? A lawyer, and when we're talking about a nuclear strike, I mean, aren't we, we're at the point where we're gonna have a nuclear strike is law even matter anymore? I mean, is, what what are we what are we doing? But it does. Uh, there are a lot of documents, policy documents, and requirements published by the uh, Department of Defense that require legal reviews. And I would say back to the question that Lauren asked real quick now is, you know, what surprised me the most, or what may have surprised me? I, I think what surprised me the most was the detail of planning that went into those options for the president before they became options to the president. Uh, one really important point, I think, with this, and, and I read this in Amy's document, it's really good. She cited a uh, former um, chief of the DIA, hey, uh, what's his name? Um, can't think of his name right now. It starts with an H, <laughs> Alzheimer's. Anyway, he said, generally speaking, the decision of the president is, is usually it's a decisive situation. It's a speedy situation. There's not much debate. You know, that sort of thing. And I think that's true, you know, uh, in the event that we're, we're under attack or something like that. Where the real work is, though, is before that ever happens. And this is what strike, uh, surprised me the most. Intel analysts, uh, in, you know, intelligence collection, intel analysts, targeteers to figure out whether we can even get to these targets. And if we can get to the targets, just like was said before, are there conventional alternatives? Are there other things out there? Are there other options? All this is laid out uh, in, in great detail, how to approach, where we're gonna approach from, what systems to use, what options we have. Maybe there's five or six different things that could go after that target and maybe five of the six are non-nuclear. Maybe it's cyber, I mean, who knows what it is. you know. But the other part is the legal review. <laughs> Every one of those options that goes to the president has a legal review. And my lawyers, when I was at Stratcom or myself, were writing this, and there are lawyers all along the way as during the planning sessions. All the planning sessions lead up to completion of an option for the president involve lots and lots of legal reviews. And we're looking for all sorts of different things, but I'll just leave it there. and I'll, I'll go into the legal review part maybe a little bit later, but um, it's important to understand that we're directed to do these legal reviews. And the reason it's important that we're directed is that tells our commanders you have to get your lawyers involved and they have to review all the plans, all the targets. They have to participate in the exercises. They have to participate in, you know, simulated, you know, decision-making uh, meetings. And anyway, I'll, I'll just stop there, turn it back over. So we've all hinted at it, but I'll go ahead and raise the elephant in the room. Um, as I mentioned before, last month in the Woodward and Costa book, uh, they dropped a, a figurative bomb on everyone by leaking excerpts of their new book, Peril, to a bunch of reporters. And that had a lot of interesting anecdotes in it around um, what General Milley reportedly did and said during the Trump administration, including one rather alarming suggestion that he had inserted himself in some way into the nuclear command and control system. There's been lots of iterations of this story, and he's clarified a lot of this in testimony. Uh, but with all of these leaks came some responses saying that you know, General Milley is a hero. This is amazing. And then also came a lot of responses saying, sorry, we've got helicopters outside, uh, that General Milley should be fired. He should resign. We've got to get rid of this guy. Um, so regardless of where we come down on it, I think there's still confusion about like, what exactly is it that General Milley did and why was it problematic? So I'm going to turn over to Alex to give a quick backgrounder there of like, what do we know about this? And was it actually problematic at all from what we know? So I just reread the section of the Woodward and Costa book before we talk. And then I read Milley's account of it, which matched pretty well. I mean, it, it doesn't seem 
like they added anything, though there's a lot more color in the Woodward and Costa book. But the, the basics of it is that first he gets called by Pelosi. This is sort of during, slightly after the riot at the Capitol. And she basically says, what are you doing to make sure this guy can't nuke people? And Millie's response is to say, it's complicated. The, the system is not as easy as you think it is. Don't worry. We're, this isn't going to happen. Not just nuclear, but even any other stupid military action. It's not going to happen. We're not going to let it happen. The military is not going along with that. And she interestingly pointed out like, well, are you going to be able to stop him if he does? And they said, of course we will. And then he, she basically points out, I think fairly like, oh, that's funny because nobody stopped the riot and nobody stopped anything there. And everybody still sort of accepts that this is fine and nobody's put him in jail or anything like this. Nobody's invoked the 25th Amendment. So, you know, what are the odds? And Woodward and Costa then say that basically he did have some doubts. And what he did was go to his people at the Nuclear Military Command Center, the M NMBCC, if I've got the acronym, if I decoded it correctly, done it right, and talked with them about the procedures. And this is how he frames it in a non-hyperbolic way, which is to, to remind them that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is supposed to be part of this meeting that Amy has mentioned already, this sort of uh, consultation, communicate, advising meeting, and that while he, and he emphasized this both to Pelosi and both to them, while the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is, is not in the chain of command, uh, it still plays a really important role in sort of facilitating the communication and in this sort of place. And, and that seems to be the limit of it, other than a sort of implicit discussion with them in which he's making it very clear that under zero circumstances for any kind of military or nuclear operation, they are not to go around him, they are not to admit him, that no matter what the circumstances are, I imply, interpret this as I'm saying, the nukes could be in the air. <laughs> do not do anything without including me on this call with the implication that you could draw between that and the stuff he said to Pelosi, that if there was something he considered to be unwise, surely, obviously, if there was something he considered to be illegal, but even unwise or unethical, that he would find ways to gum up the works, that there are ways in which perhaps not in the strict chain of command that the works could be gummed up and this could be prevented. That seemed to me to be the, the sort of heart of it, which, um, is really interesting on a lot of levels. I don't want to unpack it too much here because maybe you want to unpack it more. But but that seemed to be what I read it as saying, which is not quite the same thing as saying inserted into the chain of command, which is not quite the same thing as um, asserting uh, a military veto over a civilian order, but does get close enough to those things that you can understand why some people would say this is compromising uh, the military civilian split and things like that. Yeah, so just an overall question for any of you, Mike, Amy, Alex, uh, to, to, to do exactly what Alex said, to unpack that. Does this fit within what we know about the chairman's role in the nuclear command and the control system? And does it add an element of confusion or is it just part of, as, as Amy described, just like the normal chain of communication that uh, actually is a facilitator in some way? Or do we not know necessarily? I can add a couple of uh, points there. First, shortly before General Milley testified, um, General Hyten spoke at the Atlantic Council a couple of weeks ago and gave much more detail on how these meetings happened in the Pentagon. And he pointed out that General Milley came to him first before he had the bigger meeting because he had been commander of STRATCOM and therefore General Milley asked him about the procedures. and. General Hyten didn't get very specific, but listening to him, I could hear he was talking about these communications meetings. And it seemed that what they had conferred about General Milley and General Hyten, and again, he didn't say this, I was hearing it between the lines, was to make sure if a meeting were called, that General Milley was put on the line. That the concern was in the latter months of the administration, there were a lot of new people who had not been through confirmation working in senior positions in the Pentagon who may not have been familiar with these procedures and who was supposed to be on the line in each and every one of these calls. So what I got out of that conversation and what I got out of General Milley's memo saying, 
this is about the communications procedures, I'm in the chain of communication, was a reminder to everyone if they were put on the line for a call with senior uh, Pentagon officials, including the Secretary of Defense at the time who was acting, to remember that all of these internal documents made clear that he was to be included in those calls as well. So it wasn't so much that he was trying to insert himself somewhere that he didn't belong, which is what the press and the public got out of the reporting, but to remind the people who were running the process that the regulation said he's in the process. So just because if things happened suddenly or quickly or in other chaotic situations, phone calls would be dropped and wouldn't be made to remind them to call him. So even though Alex seems to think it didn't cross the line from what General Hyten and General Milley said, and I heard it was even further from the line than what the reporting is saying. Mike or Alex, um, uh, what do you think? Was this appropriate, inappropriate, um, fitting with the role, or is the role just not set up well to begin with? Well, um, let me just say something about the chairman's job a little bit. It's a position created by law. You know, it actually the law tells us that, that one of the things he's supposed to do is be the primary advisor, military advisor to the president, the senior uniform military advisor. So he has a function to be an advisor, whether he's part of the chain of command in a given exercise or not, because that would be any exercise, that would be any operation, not just a nuclear one. If we're operating in, um, you know, Southern command in South America, he's not part of that chain of command, but he's still the primary advisor to the president. So he has that role. Uh, whether it's whether it's proper or not, and this is going to be the ultimate lawyer dodge here, but I don't feel like I really know personally know enough yet. But one thing I did see him say or said in an article, this is true, it seemed like to me, I didn't get the impression he was doing this because he wanted to, quote, gum up the works or something like that. What I got the impression was he wanted to tell the Chinese, essentially, look, there's a lot of interesting things going on in our country right now. Don't interpret them as to us, you know, losing control. Or you're you're going to, you know, be the victim of this, including maybe things in the South China Sea and things like that. You know, I think what he was saying is, don't interpret any of this to think that we might be a threat. I think he's just trying to tamp down the concern, you know, uh, that sort of thing. I don't know that he was actually signaling that he would interject himself and get in the way of the process. So, you know, I, I don't know what his intent was. Maybe we'll hear more as we go along. I'll, I'll just add that one of the things I got out of rereading the, the prologue to the Woodward and Costa is they say, and again, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, who's, who's asserting, they say that he was worried to a degree that the Russians and Chinese might do things that might uh, 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 inflame the situation in the United States as well. They were worried that they might, China had its own issues going on at that point, but that th not only might they see something from us as a threat, but they might do something that we might perceive as a threat. Um, they might try to take advantage of the chaos that was sort of unspooling. And that's another interesting dynamic to add, I think, to the whole mindset that he's in at this moment as they report it. He is fearing things from sort of both directions. He's fearing that there could be external threats, that they could be interpreted in a way that could lead to a disproportionate or inappropriate response or something like that, um, which I thought was interesting. Uh, is it proper? Uh, you know, in, in, in a ideal world, I would say not proper, right? In an ideal world, this should, I, I actually think that we should have a purely civilian oversight system into these. Uh, I think the military track record on making those kinds of mistakes historically, not always great. Um, but anyway, we, we have a pretty firm principle in this country of civilian leadership over this sort of stuff. And it should be what is done uh, in practice in these circumstances. I think that our civilian oversight of these things is very poor when it comes to nuclear weapons. And that to me is, is a systemic problem. And that when you do have situations like this one, I don't wanna ever be in the situation of hoping that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will assert that he's the biggest adult in the room and force his way into a really difficult conversation. And he's not saying he's gonna veto anything, but you, you could be clear that he was going to make it abundant to everybody in the room what he thought was the appropriate thing. And I, and I think there is a hint in some of the things he's saying of, 
we there are procedures and ways to slow things down and things of that nature if need be um if, if he came to that but at the same time you know which, which does get you to a situation where you're relying on a military judgment more than ought to be the case but i really do feel personally that our current system does not have enough by way of civilian oversight and i'm sort of with to be honest, Pelosi on some of the things she said to him, where she said, if we had such good civilian oversight, then, you know, why isn't this guy in handcuffs? Why didn't this riot get put down immediately? Why is this even being sustained? Why is there being misinformation about this putting out by the president? Uh, it's clear that our system gives the president perhaps too much power in these respects. And so I can see the, the temptation of wanting somebody else to step in, but we haven't created that many positions for that to happen. So we're going to do, I'm going to do two more questions for the group. And I see we've got a couple in the chat so far. So if you've got other questions to for our panel, please go ahead and weigh in. Um, but on that point, Alex, just as an aside, it, even if that was not what he intended to Pelosi, it was to say, that, like, don't worry, I got it. Like, I'm you know implying that, you know, I'm going to do something to hit pause or gum up the works. She may have taken it that way. And, and she may have taken it that way. And clearly others on the internet are, are taking it that way, which I think is itself a problem in terms of generating confusion around this system. Even if the system is functioning flawlessly, the perceptions of it and the confusion around it has, has challenges. Um, all right, Mike, I'm gonna ask you to be a, a, a lawyer again. Um, so we've discussed how the president can't just physically push a button um, with a for a nuclear launch and that there are other personnel who are going to be on the line in some way in the communication chain. But given that orders have to be legal to be followed, what about legal legally? What is the legal barrier in this process? You mentioned legal review. What is the, the system or the time frame for that legal review? And is there any window for it in, in the midst of things or is it just everything before, ahead of time? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Uh, a lot of the legal reviews are conducted ahead of time. When we put options together, president has, his, as you described, briefcase. He has a lot of choices that he could make to include, as we said before, conventional. Well, there are legal reviews with each of those options. So lawyers are specifically talking to those options, you know, as, as um, um, in that briefcase, so to speak. Um, then uh, if, if an event actually were to, to occur, um, I, I can't go into detail <laughs> into who's in these conferences and who's sitting there, but there, there are, are people, uh, very high level legal advisors also uh, who have input, you know, during these uh, particular meetings as well. So you have the initial legal review by the lawyers that looked at the targets and the options. And then in the event of a conference, you know, there's, there, he will have access to legal advice. Uh, admittedly, you know, he's not going to have a lot of time. And that's why we try to write these legal opinions as, as much as possible. But I also hear you asking the question about the legality of orders, you know, and so, you know, generally speaking, you know, what we say is once the president makes a decision to do something where there's been a legal review and all that sort of thing, we, we presume, and this might, you know, it might make somebody uncomfortable, we, we presume those orders to be legal unless we really believe that, wait a minute, this is an unlawful order. Uh, if it's an unlawful order, we would be required under our own law to disobey you know, that order, but that'd be extremely risky because again, the analysis is allegedly or has theoretically already happened. The decision is made by legal advisors. This is lawful. Uh, he would have an attorney, you know, access to an attorney during that final decision-making process. And if all those folks are saying, yes, this is legal. And then somebody says, oh, this is illegal. You know, especially if it's a military person disregarding what the civilian leadership is saying, that's very risky. So you would have the obligation to disobey. But on the other hand, you know, if you're found, if it's later found to be a lawful order and then you disobey the lawful order, you know, you could be uh, in, a, in a bad situation yourself. So they, we do that analysis uh, as well, if that made any sense. Yeah, I mean, just to go to the, the next obvious point, we're talking about what's risky and it's, it is always really striking and a little almost disturbing in some ways that we can sit here very calmly in our discussion talking about the bureaucratic steps around which one person, an elected person, um, can initiate a sequence for nuclear war or nuclear strikes. 
Um, and this came up a lot in the opening months of the Trump administration. And there was a lot of concern about President Trump's authority here. But I suspect that concern was actually less about President Trump and actually more about recognizing that this system makes people uncomfortable for a lot of the reasons that we're talking about today. And that it was that maybe it not set up in a way that is aligned with people's um, values or their expectations or anything else. So Alex, I'm going to give you the, the final question, then I'll give it uh, have a few more from our audience here. And that is, does this experience in the Trump era, whether this last incident or the overall debate that it stirred up over the last four years, does it show that our, the system works well or as well as can be expected? Or to your point, that it barely works, that there's a lot of things that you could do to, to modify it in some way? I don't really think it tells us too much in the sense that it wasn't tested to the degree that we're talking about. To our knowledge, Trump never woke up one day and tried to use nuclear weapons, right? And as a result, we don't really know what his latitude is. We do have some examples, and I think they come less from the nuclear, but some of his other things, like the assassination of Soleimani, right? Where the reports are that he was given this range of options with the intention that he wouldn't choose the most extreme one, and then he chose the most extreme one, and then they went through with it anyway. And that's a that's a bad approach, whoever's giving presidents options, don't do that. But um, I think there's a lot of evidence that our system is um, essentially in some of these respects, um, not stress tested. We have not hit the limit of what's possible with it. So I don't really take a lot of solace from, you know, I don't feel better because of what Millie did. I feel a little better that people were taking this, that seriously, which is good, because uh, I think that's warranted. At the same time, we don't really know what would happen if he did try to do something and then Millie gets onto the call and then he tries to do something and then Millie disagrees whose lawyers are going to win against whose other lawyers. We don't know what the result of that would be. It's still a big uncertain sort of question mark. And I don't like that there's that much uncertainty in it. Um, I would rather have it be a little bit more certain than this. I, I guess the, la the thing I would say about it my feeling is that a lot of what we've taken away from the last few weeks of the Trump administration and, and all of that was that a lot of these institutions, whether they are sort of like the election institution itself, uh, the nuclear uh, and, and military command systems, they work on a basis of people agree to follow the rules. As, as Mike said, it's these, these things are, you know, they're created by law how important is law, right? If we are all agreeing that we're gonna follow the law, then it's super important. At what point when you start pushing against the barriers of that or breaking the law and nothing sort of happens as a result of that, do you conclude that this grand edifice is actually only sort of works as long as we all agree it works? And I feel like at the end of the Trump administration, we had some things that were very, depressing and other things that were essentially reassuring, right? We had some things where in the end people said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna play that game. I refuse to sign this thing. I refuse to take part in this. We're not gonna do that strategy done. And that's great. I'm glad that we had a few people who did this um, at really key juncture. Some of the stuff we've learned about Mike Pence and the, and the certification and all that kind of stuff. Uh, recently. On the other hand, once you see that it comes down to only a couple people agreeing to sort of stand up on principles, that's the part that's really disturbing because you can imagine this reshuffled with different people and a different joint chiefs or a different vice president or a different whatever and get totally different results. And that's the part that feels um, lucky in the sense of not controlled. On that really happy note, I'll go to a next question around the possible risk of human error. This is a question from Lauren Pompey. She says, uh, regarding minimization of potential risk with consideration to international instability and other hostilities, how fatal can something as small as human error be? And I, what I hear from that is, is this a system where we feel as though we have minimized the risk of human error? Like, is this mostly well within our control or is human error still something that we worry about to a degree? So uh, anyone, um, I'm not sure who the best person is for this, maybe Amy to start? Sure. Um, there are numerous types of circumstances within which the president would consider using nuclear weapons. So if you try to minimize the risk in one circumstance, you might actually be creating risk in another circumstance. 
as I pointed out early on, there are a couple of cases where the military wakes up the president, one we're under nuclear attack, one it's another military operation. And then there's the circumstance where the president wakes up the military. And a lot of the discussion for the last five years has focused on how to minimize the risk of human error if it's the president waking up the military. And a lot of the answers to minimizing that risk involve bringing in other people to either confirm or veto the decision. And as I look through all those alternatives that people present, I notice that they often make the risk in the other circumstances higher. So if you want to make sure the president can't wake up one morning in a bad mood and decide he wants to use nuclear weapons by having 17 other people weigh in on the decision, you're now in a military crisis where promptness is important, but you've got 17 other people who have to be briefed up on the circumstances, maybe a debate on the floor of Congress and a vote three weeks later and all of us, you know, so risk is a matter of relative to the circumstances and even though we've been focused on the risk of human error in terms of a president waking up the military you can't solve that problem without considering the risks and benefits in the other circumstances so the short answer to the question is no we can't resolve the human error risk that's out there without introducing other problems mike we've got, oh, go ahead mike yeah i, I would say yeah I, I i agree with all that we can't completely eliminate uh, human error. And I think what Alex has, has been doing a little bit is pointing out to, you know, questionable activities by the, the Trump administration and extrapolating from that. See, you know, we might have this misuse of nuclear weapons. And I think it's a fair, it's a fair issue. But the only thing I would say is if you, you know, General Hyten used to say this at Stratcom, if you want to get an idea what a non-nuclear world looks like, take a look at World War One. take a look at World War Two. meaning even without nuclear weapons, there's still human error. Human error is not is not something unique to the possibility of the use of nukes. Now, I admit, if you make a mistake with a nuclear weapon, chances are the, the results will be significantly, you know, more serious than with conventional force. But, you know, yeah, humans make errors. And, uh, and I, I don't know that that necessarily means the alternative is completely safe either, meaning the World War I scenario or something like that. I, I, one more I just want to jump in real quick on the yeah, human error. Yeah. For, mm -hmm. for me, it's important to think about like where and what type of error are you worried about? So I'm, we've done, a, they, they've done a really good job since the 1970s in eliminating the risk from certain categories of human error, right? I'm not that worried about a random soldier setting off a nuclear weapon. That's very hard to do at this point because they have engineered that to be very hard to do. And they've made it very hard for somebody to accidentally go to nuclear war. They've made it very hard for a random soldier to purposely go to nuclear war in an unauthorized way. That became a real concern in the 60s. And they came up with really clever systems to tamp down that risk in really good ways. The one place where human error that I do worry about is again at the very, very top of the situation because that isn't what the system is designed to prevent. It's not designed with the idea that the president can be an error for either because he's in a bad mood or he's a bad person or mental illness or uh, uh, bad information. And we do know in recent memory of say, presidents who have gone to war on really bad information. And so that's the level that I worry more about human error, but I do appreciate, and I, I, I will say that I don't worry that much about the sort of more outlandish situations of the president gets up and he's angry and he nukes China. I, I don't really, that's the kind of thing where, as I think Mike would agree with me, the legal people would put the skids on that kind of unprovoked, you know, disproportionate activity really fast. That's the kind of thing that's easy to say no to. And it's easy to not feel you're being risky by saying, no, thanks. I don't want to participate in a genocide for no reason. Right. That, that, that doesn't worry me much. I do worry about things that are on the line where, you know, Iran does something really risky and awful and unpleasant and abhorrent or China or whatever, what do you do in that situation? I do worry that you could have something shade towards a really bad decision. Um, and that would be the situation where the legality would be a lot harder to argue and things like that. So I'm not worried. I don't worry about the accidents quite as much as I think I would have if this we were having this conversation 40 years ago or something like that. 
So on that point around legality, I'm going to give the final question to Mike, because there's been a number from the audience that are asking about legality and illegality and like, and it, can you make clear what's in the law? Uh, that, and um, as somebody who's married to a lawyer, I'll just say that like, if you're hoping a lawyer is going to give the clear answer, I, I wish you a lot of patience in life, but hopefully Mike can help us out on this one. I'll, I'll give the most simple one. And that is from Saul Tannenbaum, but it echoes some from Marty Hellman and others. Could one of the panelists give an example of a hypothetical launch order for nuclear weapons that would be illegal, that it is on its face, we can, some, somebody will be able to respond in some way that it's illegal? Okay, sure. Uh, let, me, let me take a stab at it. First off, um, when we talk about the law, you know, what, what law are we really focusing on when we do a legal analysis? At the point where the president's in a situation where he or she's going to make a decision to use a nuclear weapon, we're really talking about the law of armed conflict at that point. We, we, we would call that the use and bellow prong of the law of war. It's Latin for the law of war, the law that applies during war. So that's the focus when we're at a decision point to use nuclear weapons. And there, um, primarily, we would, we would look to the language of what we would, if you want to look this up later, Additional Protocol 1 to the 19, 1977 Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, because it gives us the requirements for targeting. So, for example, the first thing we have to resolve is whether or not a target is a legitimate military objective. That's the first criteria. Is the target a military objective? And I'll give you an example of what is and what isn't here in just a second. So what the law of war says is you can't attack civilian objects. You can't intentionally attack civilian objects. You can only intentionally attack military objects. This is rule number one. So what would that mean? Well, if I were to use a nuclear weapon on a purely economic target, it has no value other than its economics. Okay, that would probably be a violation of the law of war because it's not a military objective. The military objective is something by its nature, location, purpose, or use gives the enemy a definite military advantage. Here's the, so let me give you an example on the other end of the spectrum. A, a fleet at sea, you know, a, a, an adversary's naval fleet at sea, you know, bound for some, you know, landing invasion or something like that. That would be a, a potential legal target because you know, you're only going to strike military objects. You're only military ships, military personnel. You know, that one's kind of an easy one. That would be the other extreme. So something, it has to be a military objective, number one. Number two, if it is a military objective, then you have to do an analysis called a proportionality analysis, where you try to determine whether or not the loss to civilians would be excessive in relation to the value of the target. Because even though just a minute ago I said you can only talk or attack military objectives, well, you know, nothing's that per perfectly clean in combat. You're going to end up with people who are going to be hurt who you had no intention of hurting. It's, it's, and, and that, that excess loss, sometimes referred to as collateral damage, you know, is in, with a nuclear weapon is a real potential. And so you have to say, well, you know, here's what we think the losses would be you know, to things other than that military objective. Here's the number of civilians we think that might be involved. And then you have to weigh the value of that target against it. Anyway, those are just two examples. There's lots and lots more. You can't, for example, after Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, those cities had little mom and pop businesses sprinkled throughout those cities. And the theory was back in World War II, we can't really get to those individual targets you know, because it's all these mom and pop industrial, you know, targets. So if we attack the entire city, we'll get all of those targets. Well, the law of war now says you, you really can't do that. You know, you've got to go after individual targets. You can't, you know, we can't hit this individual target. So back to the point we made earlier, and I'm almost done here, I promise. <laughs> back to the point we said earlier. So maybe the answer is don't use a nuke. And nuke's not going to work in that situation. You've got to use a conventional kinetic strike or a cyber attack or something like that. A space, you know, some something we can do in space possibly. I mean, there's other options out there besides nuclear weapons. Anyway, that's just kind of the, the analysis, some of the analysis. 
Well, Amy, Mike, Alex, thank you so much. I am both more informed, also somehow more confused, more concerned, but also less concerned, just a mix of it all at one time. Uh, you guys have been fantastic panelists, uh, and I, I very much encourage everyone to follow all of their work, starting with the, the CRS piece that Amy mentioned at the beginning that was published in mid-September. I'm going to turn it back over to our hosts at uh, Institute for Security and Technology to close us out, but I really appreciate everyone joining us today. This was a great conversation. And a special thank you to you, Lauren, for leading us in this conversation. Um, again, thank you to everyone who's tuned in now, and we'll see this in the future. Uh, stay tuned with the Institute for Security and Technology for more on nuclear command and control issues and a lot more, including cyber futures. It's going to be really an interesting couple of months ahead. So please do subscribe and stay tuned. But thank you again for tuning in. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to our intrepid moderator, Lauren. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.